what is up, you guys? Welcome back to the Morning Hour podcast. I am one of your hosts, Allison. I'm your other host, Katie. And this is episode two. Yay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So for the first episode, we dove into Galveston, Texas, and it was pretty punchy. It was pretty fun, all that kind of good stuff. But um, today I'm going to take us way down. (laughs) We're staying in Texas, but um, this is going to be really rough. So... I'm going to go ahead and give like a trigger warning here for um, rape, sexual assault of minors, murder, Mm. just a lot of like really hard topics. So if that's not something that you want to listen to, we will catch you in the next one. But if not, if you, you know, if you're comfortable listening, then let's go ahead and just dive on in. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to be talking about a case that took place in Austin, Texas in 1991. So Austin was a very different place at the time. And what happened absolutely like rocked Austin like to its core. Mm. The population was only at a mere 596,000, which is nothing in comparison to the over 2 million people that live there today. Jeez. Yeah. Like, you know how bustling Austin is now? That's way oversaturated. (laughs) Yeah, it was not like that back then. It wasn't like the go-to city for partying and food trucks like it is today. It had a very small college town feel, and violent crime was actually, like, pretty rare. Hmm. I mean, granted, 1991 in general was a different time. Like, people felt comfortable letting their kids go to the mall by themselves, walk places by themselves, you know, like, things that parents would probably think twice about doing today yeah absolutely so a little bit before midnight on friday december 6th 1991 an officer with the austin police department was patrolling the area when he noticed smoke coming from the i can't believe it's yogurt a local yogurt shop located in the hillside strip mall he reported it to the dispatcher but nobody was prepared for the reality of what was inside of this yogurt shop Four teenage girls were found inside, all of them having been shot in the head execution style before the fire was set. Oh, my God. This would later be named the Yogurt Shop Murders, and to this day, it's still one of the most puzzling and frustrating cases that Austin has seen. Despite there being many suspects, confessions, and even arrests made, this case is still unsolved. So before we go any further, we need to talk about who these girls were. So Sarah and Jennifer Harbison were born to Mike and Barbara, high school sweethearts of the New Boston area near the Texarkana border. They later settled in Austin so Mike could take divinity courses so he could get his graduate degree. The plan was for Mike to go to school while Barbara worked, and when Mike graduated, the family would move back to New Boston. But Barbara ended up really enjoying Austin. She thought the girls would have better opportunities if they stayed. So that's what they did. Mike and Barbara got divorced, and Barbara would later meet and marry a man named Frank Sirachi in 1980. The girls were extremely close with their mom, some even describing them as three sisters rather than two sisters and a mom. For a majority of their school-aged lives, Sarah and Jennifer attended a private Catholic school, but the girls wanted to attend public school when they reached high school. So in 1990, the family moved to a nicer and safer neighborhood in the northwest area of Austin, only a few miles away from Lanier High School, where the girls would go to school. Jennifer started her senior year at Lanier just a few months before her death, and she was known to be extremely outgoing and social in her new environment. She was extremely active, you know, like she did not like to have any kind of free time. She was a relay runner on Lanier's varsity track team, and she was the district vice president of the FFA organization and the president of Lanier's FFA chapter. So I'm going to mention FFA a few times because all of these girls were involved in FFA. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who are unaware, FFA stands for Future Farmers of America. It's basically just like an extracurricular activity for those interested in like agriculture. A big part of being involved in FFA is that you raise, like, show animals. So Jennifer and her sister Sarah were raising sheep to show at the annual Austin Livestock Show. I remember FFA was, like, huge whenever I was in high school. It kind of was for us, too. Like, I I knew so many people who were in FFA. Yeah. It wasn't 
for me, of course. No, it wasn't for me either. <laughs> but I knew a lot of people who were like gung ho. Really for into it. it. Yeah, it's really cool. It really is. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just not. I'm afraid I would fail at it, but <laughs> I'm just really not cool. like I'm not a farmer. I'm not a good farmer. <laughs> Sarah Harbison was only a few months into her sophomore year at Lanier High School, but she quickly found her place and fell right into the activities just like Jennifer did. Besides FFA, Sarah was also on the volleyball and girls basketball teams. She played basketball in middle school and she was also a cheerleader, so she would like finish playing a game with the girls basketball team, run into the locker room to get changed, and then go cheer for the boys teams. So she was like Mm -hmm. constantly busy. Not me. (laughs) I was definitely not like that in high school (laughs) at all. I was like, I need a nap like twice a day thank you i used to sleep under like the desks in the yearbook classroom with a snuggie so if that tells you anything about me (laughs) oh my god do you remember like when snuggies were like all the rage yes i used to walk down the hallway and i didn't give two fucks as you sit in front of me with like a big blanket wrapped in a blanket yeah Yeah. (laughs) not much is very not much has changed no not Not much is very changed okay (laughs) allison So, like I said, she was a very busy girl. Mm -hmm. Uh, She also had a new boyfriend who she had been seeing for just about, like, three weeks when he gave her his class ring. Mm. It was gold, and with, like, it had, like, a tractor on one side, Mm. his initials on the other, and, like, a green stone in the center. Okay. Sarah would be wearing this ring on the night she died. It was found next to a Mickey Mouse watch on a pile of clothing right next to her body. Ugh. Yeah. So, that, to me, like, the Mickey Mouse, like, the imagery of, like, this class ring, the Mickey Mouse watch. Yeah. These were kids. These are children. These are fucking children. That's awful. So Sarah's best friend was Amy Ayers, the youngest of the girls. Amy was born in Johnson County, Texas, to her parents Pamela and Bob, and she had an older brother named Sean. Amy was known for her love of the outdoors and animals. She spent a lot of time on her family's ranch and started riding horses at just three years old. Her father described her as all cowgirl after the murders. She had aspirations of one day becoming a veterinarian, and she loved country music. She had posters of George Strait all over her walls of her bedroom. <laughs> kind of like how I had like posters of like the Jonas Brothers. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> George Strait for her. <laughs> Cute. So, in 1985, the family moved to Austin, and in 1991, her brother Sean convinced her to join FFA because he knew, like, that she would love it, and Mm -hmm. she did. She was accepted into the program as a junior member, where she thrived. She was actually nominated to be the vice president of the chapter, which was a huge feat for someone so young. Yeah. This is where Amy would meet her new best friend, Sarah Harbison. Together, the girls made plans for the next school year for when Amy would join Sarah at Lanier High School. But these plans would never come to fruition. Mm. So the last of the four girls was Eliza Thomas. I love that name. Eliza. That's cute. I've always liked that name. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I didn't think about it whenever I was pregnant. But anyway. (laughs) So Eliza was also a senior at Lanier High School. And she was born to her parents, James and Maria in Austin. And she had a younger sister named Sonora. Her parents divorced when Eliza was seven years old. And her parents had shared custody until Eliza was 14 And at that point, she chose to live with her mother and her sister Sonora lived with their father. Eliza was an avid reader with a gift for language and poetry. And her mother believed that she could have been a writer or poet had she wanted to be. But like the other girls, she loved animals. She was also an FFA and Eliza and Jennifer would both be nominated for FFA Queen. Her most prized possession was her bright green 1971 VW Carmen Ghia. And she did all of the repairs on this car herself. Hmm. So, like, she was, like, very mechanically inclined. Yeah. She told her parents that all she wanted that year for Christmas was car parts, <laughs> which sounds very much like my husband. Yeah, it does. <laughs> so, to help pay for gas and to keep up with the maintenance on her car and just to, like, generally be able to help take care of, like, like take a load off of her mom, Yeah, she got a part-time job working nights and weekends at I Can't Believe It's Yogurt, making four thirty-five an hour. Hey. <laughs> Four thirty five an hour. And we thought like seven seventy five or whatever minimum wage is now is I low. Know. But it was different then. Yeah. But aside from getting her hands dirty with FFA and working on her car, she was also a girly girl who loved makeup and had aspirations of becoming a model. Hmm. She took her appearance very seriously. Her mother would later recall that Eliza would wash her face up to three times a day. She loved dancing with her friends and was a very smart and determined girl. So... All of these four girls, you know, they all had similar interests, you know, all of them involved with FFA, Mm -hmm. all of them loved country music, they were all friends, you know, just Mm -hmm. 
typical girls from Texas, you know, like I'm sure we both knew a lot of girls like this back in high school, you know, or at least, yeah, absolutely. All of them, you know, had high hopes and aspirations for their future. Yeah. And that just makes it like even more gut wrenching. Yeah. So let's get into the timeline of that day. On Friday, December 6th, 1991, all of the girls attended school as normal and did things that they did every day, like tend to their show animals at a local barn before and after school. Jennifer dropped Sarah off at home after school and drove over to her boyfriend Sammy's apartment where he lived with his mom. Sammy was not at school that day because he was going to his grandfather's funeral, so Jennifer decided to go see him just to make sure like he was doing okay. She had a few errands that she had to run after this, but the goal was to make it back home by 7 so that she could get ready for her 8 p.m. shift at I Can't Believe It's Yogurt at the Hillside Strip Mall, where she also worked part-time. Mm-hmm. That night, it was only Eliza and Jennifer to be closing the shop. Eliza had been working at the yogurt shop for a few months, and when Jennifer was, like, looking for a part-time job, Eliza convinced her to apply at the shop. So, you know, it was easy, fun, and they got to, like, hang out while they worked. Yeah. So, granted, it was 1991, But whenever I was in high school, like, I would never close any place by myself. Like, we we always had, like, an adult manager that would, like, close with us. Same. I worked in the mall for a while at a closing store, and we were not, like, allowed, like, to just close by ourselves. Yeah. I mean, usually the manager wasn't any older than, like, a college kid, but it was still not a high schooler. Yeah. You know? So I, I thought whenever I was researching, I was like, that's a little bizarre, but... It was a different time. It was 1991, you know, so it's besides the point. But around 4.30 p.m., Barbara remembers coming home from work and seeing Sarah sitting on the couch eating an orange. Sarah rehoused to her mom, like, about her plans with Amy to go to the North Cross Mall that evening. And she was really excited because this was actually the first time either of the girls would be able to go to the mall without a parent there with them. Mm -hmm. So they were, like, pumped, you know, like, I remember that feeling, like yay we we don't have to go with our mom anymore we're yeah. we're grown 12 <laughs> years old so north cross mall was kind of like the place to be for teenagers back in the 90s like mm-hmm. malls in general became like a huge hangout point for teenagers and to be honest up until the boom of internet shopping and amazon the mall was still the place to be yeah even when yeah. we were in school like i was absolutely a mall rat oh yeah my mom started letting me run around with friends when I was, like, 13 or 14, mm-hmm. which... And I didn't stop until, like, 17? Yeah. 16, 17? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, okay. for, like, a couple of years, every single Saturday, mall, yeah. mall, mall. Then after I worked there, I was pretty soured on it. Yeah. <laughs> I oh, I could, <laughs> I could imagine. I could imagine. So North Cross Mall definitely catered to its younger crowd. Aside from popular stores, it also had an ice skating rink and a movie theater. So the plan was that Jennifer would take Sarah and Amy to the mall on her way to work, go pick them up when she got a break and when the mall closed at nine and that the girls would chill at the yogurt shop until Jennifer was done with her shift when the shop closed at 11 Mm -hmm. and that they'd all three ride back to Jennifer and Sarah's house for a sleepover. Okay. That was the that was the plan. Mm-hmm. So around 6.30 p.m., Eliza got home to change into her uniform, which was an I Can't Believe It's Yogurt embroidered polo, dark jeans, and white Reeboks. She arrived to the yogurt shop to begin her shift at 7 p.m. Soon after Eliza got there, the girl that was currently working left, leaving Eliza to run the shop by herself until Jennifer arrived at 8. That's a really short shift, 8 to 11. Yeah, it is. That's really weird. Like, I remember having to get it, like, be to work at like four or five yeah if you and then work close, until close yeah. yeah usually right after school time yeah and then work till close interesting at the same time that eliza is starting her shift jennifer arrived home to change and get ready for hers wearing the same uniform polo as eliza with dark jeans and black high top reeboks she put on her black timex watch and sarah grabs a black denim jacket with a lightning bolt on the front of it and the girls leave to go pick up amy amy was wearing her brother's leather bomber jacket jeans multiple handmade friendship bracelets and a belt with a heart-shaped buckle on it amy also brings her jiminy cricket overnight bag and leaves it in the truck when they're dropped off at the mall so considering the north cross mall is only like a few minutes away from the hillside strip mall as soon as jennifer dropped the girls off she went ahead and headed to work as planned eliza would work the cash register and jennifer would work the counter taking and making the orders as they came in so it appears as if most of if not all of the stores in this strip mall closed at or before 10 so the yogurt shop was the only one open until 11 so 
keep that in mind. Okay, so the next little bit of information that I'm going to give is basically customer accounts going back over rehashing that evening and what they saw whenever. Okay. Yeah. So between 8.15 and 8.30 p.m., a regular customer named Lucella Jones pulled up to the yogurt shop to get some yogurt for her husband, who had just had some dental work done. When she parked, she noticed only two vehicles in the parking lot, Jennifer's Chevy S10 and Eliza's VW Carmen Ghia. She claimed that when she walked in, there were only two other people in the shop besides the two girls working. These two other people were two younger men and appeared just to be customers, but they were seated at the table closest to the door. Lucella remembered feeling unsettled by these young men, who she said looked to be between 14 and 16 years old. One young man was sitting in a chair facing away from her, and the other was standing at the table facing her. She didn't really get the best look at the one sitting down, but she said that the one standing up and facing her was between 5'4 and 5'7 and wasn't clean cut and had kind of like a hippie look. Okay. According to her. So I'm assuming she just means that he had like long or shaggy kind of hair. Okay. She thought that he may have been Hispanic, but he could have also just been white with a tan. Okay. The boys seemed very interested in a bag that sat in between them on the table. She claims that the boy that was standing would sporadically like stick his hand in the bag and like stir the contents around. Okay. Making whatever was in the bag kind of like clang about. Huh. She thought the contents of the bag could have been marbles, coins, keys, or maybe even bullets. Bullets, okay. Yeah. yeah. She claimed that it didn't appear that the boys were eating or drinking anything, which if, if you're in a yogurt shop, you would be. Mm -hmm. But she also admitted that she didn't have the best view of their table. So they may have had the yogurt on the table and she just didn't see it or had already been done eating their yogurt and was just kind of like hanging out a little bit after finishing. Right. So she got up to the counter, ordered her husband's yogurt, and a small part of her wanted to like ask the girls to make sure that they were all right and comfortable. But the girls seemed fine. They were kind of like joking about with each other. So Lucella ignored this uncomfortable feeling, paid for her yogurt, and left. Mm. A little before 9 p.m., Jennifer left the yogurt shop and drove to the mall to pick up Amy and Sarah. When they all returned to the strip mall, Jennifer went back inside to continue working, and Sarah and Amy walked a few doors down to Mr. Gotti's Pizza. They ordered and brought the pizza back to the yogurt shop. A few customers in the yogurt shop remember seeing two girls sitting at a table around 9.30, talking, laughing, and eating pizza. At 9.30 p.m., Eliza's mother, Maria, stopped by to say hello and just to see how work was going. Mm -hmm. This was pretty normal. If the girls were working late, they'd often have, like, various family members stop by to say hello and, like, check on them. Yeah. When Maria arrived, Eliza was on the phone with her younger sister, Sonora, trying to convince her to ride her bike to the yogurt shop to hang out. But Sonora was home alone and didn't want to leave without her parents' permission, so she stayed home. Eliza ends the call with her sister and continues working and talking with her mom. As Eliza was talking with her mother between 9.30 and 10, an ex-military officer by the name of Daryl Croft pulled up to the yogurt shop. At this point, Daryl owned his own security company, and his car had lights on the top of it, similar to a police car. Because of his background and current position, he was used to being like a little bit more observant than most. When he walked in, he noticed Eliza and Jennifer behind the counter, Maria standing by the cash register talking to Eliza, and Jennifer taking the orders of a couple that was standing at the counter. Behind this couple, Daryl noticed a young man who stood out because he was acting like really fidgety and like he was just acting off. Okay. So Croft describes this man as being in his early to mid 20s with a medium build standing anywhere between 5'10 to 6 feet tall. This guy was wearing like a green military style jacket. Okay. When it was the man's turn to go up to the counter to order, he hesitated before turning around and asking Daryl if the car with the lights belonged to him. He asked him if he was a cop or a security guard, basically trying to scope out the situation. Mm -hmm. Daryl told him that he owned a security company, and the young man turned around, walked to the counter, and ordered a Sprite from Jennifer. She put a can of Sprite on the counter, and the young man took it to Eliza at the cash register, where he paid for the soda. But instead of leaving or going to a table to take a seat, the young man headed to the back area of the shop. After Daryl ordered his yogurt and got to the cash register to pay, he asked Eliza where the young man had gone off to. She told him that he had asked to use the bathroom and that customers aren't really supposed to use it, but that the man claimed that he really had to go. Okay. 
Daryl Croft's eyewitness testimony would later be brought into question because the yogurt shop had a men and women's bathroom that were both open to the public by law. He wanted to kind of stick around for a bit to see what this dude's deal was, but he could only wait for so long. Daryl was so uneased by this guy that when he was going to leave, he actually forgot his yogurt on the counter. Eliza had to call him back to the counter to grab it. Daryl Croft and Maria left a few minutes apart, and shortly thereafter, Eliza's father and stepmother popped in to say hello and to check in on their way home. They were there for about 15 to 20 minutes. Various other customers come in and out between 9.30 and 10. Another couple of regulars came in around 10 p.m., Joseph Sauter and Eva Reed, and they talked with the girls as they waited on their yogurt and then left. Another customer would later come forward saying that around 10.30 p.m., they saw a white or Hispanic man sitting in an older white vehicle in the parking lot. They couldn't tell why, but they felt this guy was suspicious. It's also to be noted that next to the yogurt shop was a party store, the office of the party store shared a wall with the yogurt shop, and the party shop typically closed at 7 p.m., but that evening, the owner, Jorge Barney, stayed late to try to get ahead of the holiday rush. So he went to grab a pizza from Mr. Gotti's, went back to the store, put on reruns of Cheers, and got to work. Later on that night, Jorge Barney would be the first person to see and smell the smoke coming from the yogurt shop. Hmm. But he reported that he never heard anything, not even a single gunshot. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And like I said, shared a wall. Around 10.40 p.m., Tim Stryker and Margaret Sheen came into the shop and their order was rung in at 10.42 p.m. This was the last actual sale of the day. Okay. But it wouldn't be the last time that the register was opened. Margaret and Tim sat in a booth to eat their yogurt and Margaret noticed two other people in the shop. They were sitting at the table closest to the register. These people were wearing large hoodies with the hoods up, so she couldn't tell if they were men, women, whatever. She claimed that she assumed they were men due to their size and their stature. But they were sitting at the table and, like, huddled in almost, like, as if they were, like, talking to each other, but yeah. in a way that they didn't want anybody else to hear what they were talking about. So as Margaret and Tim ate their yogurt, they noticed Jennifer starting to do her closing duties, like wiping down the counters and putting the chairs up onto the tables in the dining room so that the floors could be mopped. They decided to leave to let the girls close the shop, leaving Eliza and Jennifer with these two hooded customers. When Margaret and Tim left, one of the girls locked the door from the inside so nobody else could come in, but someone from the inside could walk out, and turned the open sign to closed. A little after 11 p.m., a teenage girl was walking past the strip mall on her way to the North Cross Mall movie theater, where she was going to a midnight showing of Rocky Horror Picture Show. But she recalled that the lights in the yogurt shop were still on. This stood out because, like I said before, the yogurt shop was the only place in this strip mall open until 11. But it was past 11, and the shop should have been closed and dark like the rest of the, sh the shopping mall, but mm -hmm. it wasn't. So a little bit about how the shop was left tells us a lot about what the girls were doing when they were interrupted, mm -hmm. seemingly. All of the chairs on the dining room were on top of the tables, except for the two chairs closest to the cash register, where the hooded people had been sitting. Okay. There was a silver stool in front of the frozen yogurt machine, and the top of the machine was open, meaning that someone was getting ready to like clean the inside of the machine. A rag was bunched up on top of the counter as if someone was wiping down the counter before something caused them to abandon the rag. In the back room, a Mr. Gotti's pizza box was sitting on the table by the sink. There were utensils and, sh and topping containers in the sink. It's believed that Amy and Sarah had brought their pizza to the back room at some point and that they started doing dishes to help Eliza and Jennifer close faster so that they could get out of there quicker. Mm-hmm. The back door was found unlocked, so it seemed as if whoever had done this had either entered through the back door or were already in the shop when the front door was locked from the inside. The last transaction on the register was a no sale, and it was performed at 11.03 p.m., meaning the register was opened but without a sale being performed. $540 was taken from the register. At 11.48 p.m., Austin police officer Troy Gay was doing patrol of the area when he saw the smoke coming from the yogurt shop. As he pulled in, he saw Jorge Barney waving his arms. He had noticed the smoke shortly before. Once firefighters were dispatched and got into the building, they started looking for the source of the fire. They assumed that someone just left an oven on, but there was no oven. It was a yogurt shop. They don't need an oven. 
Yeah. At this point, the windows were completely blacked out from the smoke, making it impossible to see in. Smoke was still filling the shop, so they got on their hands and knees and made their way to the back of the shop to avoid the smoke, looking to find the source of the fire. They determined that the hottest part of the shop was in the storage room and the south wall. Putting out these fires created a bunch of steam and in addition to the smoke made visibility even worse. These guys were in full firefighting gear, masks included, so typically these men would like use hand gestures to like communicate. Yeah. But this particular firefighter didn't know how to gesture at what he saw next. So this particular firefighter tapped on his partner on the shoulder and through his mask yelled, is that a foot? Mm. The men stepped back, and that's when they found another body. They reported back to their team that they had found two victims. Mm. They were kids, and they were nude. Oh. Around midnight, Sergeant John Jones, the only homicide officer on duty that night, received the call about two deaths and the fire at the yogurt shop. As he headed that way, he received another call. They found another body. And just before he arrived, he received another call. They found a fourth victim. It's reported that the fire was started around 11.42 p.m., 39 minutes after the no-sale was performed on the cash register. So earlier I said that the back door was unlocked, Mm -hmm. so whoever did this was either already in the shop or had come in through the back door, but investigators are certain that whoever did this left through the back door. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the crime scene. Again, trigger warning times 10. Hmm. All four of the girls' bodies were found nude. It's believed they were forced to undress at gunpoint. Hmm. Majority of the girls' clothes were in a pile next to their bodies. All of the girls had been shot in the head execution style before the fire was set. Jennifer was found with her hands behind her back near the shelving unit. Sarah was found near the back door, her hands bound behind her with a pair of her underwear. She was also gagged and raped. Eliza had been stacked on top of her, and she was also gagged with her hands tied behind her back. Mm. Amy Ayers was found a little bit away from the other girls. She was closer to the restrooms and entrance to the dining area. Sarah, Eliza, and Jennifer were all unrecognizable due to the fire. Amy was also burned, but she received second and early third degree burns rather than being charred like the other girls. The amount of blood at the scene told investigators that the girls had been shot prior to the fire being set. Hmm. So when Amy was shot the first time, the bullet missed her brain. So at some point she was shot again. It's theorized that the killers had stacked all four bodies on top of one another, but that Amy had pulled herself off and managed to crawl away to a different part of the store, possibly knocking Jennifer off of the stack in the process. Oh God. The store manager was called to see if they could identify the victims, but she couldn't. Later recalling that, quote, they had no faces, end quote. Jennifer and Eliza were identified by the work schedule and the registrations in their vehicles that were still in the parking lot. Oh, God. Amy and Sarah were identified by process of elimination and the families were notified. Amy Ayers' mom recalls that when police arrived and asked if she was Amy's mom, she thought they were going to tell her that Amy had been, like, sexually assaulted. She couldn't, like, register what had actually happened. Hmm. When Jennifer and Sarah's father got the call, he just screamed and hung up the phone. When firefighters come onto a scene like this, the only thing that they care about is putting the fire out. They are not the investigators. They are not the homicide detectives. They don't realize that by using these high-powered fire hoses, they could potentially be washing away DNA evidence in an active crime scene. Mm. They're just worried about making sure that the fire doesn't spread. Right. A former Austin area reporter named Dick Ellis covered the case thoroughly, and he said, quote, They came in with hoses blazing. That's their job. They believed it was just a fire, and after the flames were put out, they discovered the girls' bodies, end quote. So due to the high power hoses and the fire itself, the investigators were walking into a pretty corrupted crime scene. At this point, Austin didn't have its own forensics unit, but the Texas Department of Public Safety did have a new CSI lab as well as one technician trained in DNA collection. But trained does not mean experienced, just so we're clear. And going back to part of where I was saying how that it was a pretty corrupted crime scene. Mm -hmm. 
um, I read in a couple of different different sources that said that the firefighters believed that they actually walked on the girls at one point oh, before no. they actually knew yeah. that they were there. Oh, gosh. So the protocol in cases like this would be for the medical examiner to remove the bodies from the scene for analysis. But the scene had already been corrupted by the fire and the fire hoses, so John Jones insisted the bodies be processed on the scene before being moved. He was worried that they would lose trace evidence on the bodies had they been moved. They seemed to care a lot about the DNA evidence on the bodies, which is great, but the treatment of the remainder of the crime scene is a hot mess, to say the least. The bathrooms were not dusted for fingerprints. There were two full trash bags from that day that were not searched or taken in as evidence, which these trash bags could have contained napkins, receipts, empty Sprite cans, you know, like... Yeah. Anything that tells us a little bit about who was in there that evening that maybe didn't come forward. So you also had so many different types of personnel coming in and out of the yogurt shop. And there was no log that would determine who and when these people were going in and out and like what they were doing. And a lot of evidence just disappeared. Mm. Yeah. So this crime scene was just a shit show for lack of better words. So they were able to determine that the fire was set above floor level since the shelving units and the back room had more damage at the top. And an aluminum ladder found in the storage area was missing the top two steps. And the top of a mop handle was also missing, meaning that a very hot fire had swept across the ceiling and worked its way down. Weird. An arson investigator from the Austin Police Department concluded that the fire was set in a back corner of the store on a set of metal shelves. And the fire then spread upwards and out, eventually moving to the floor and the bodies. It's said that the fire burned over 1,200 degrees. Mm. He noticed a V-shaped pattern on one of the walls and believed that this was the point of origin for the fire. The shelves, ladder, mop, and mop bucket were all placed in an alley by the yogurt shop before mysteriously disappearing. Uh. So none of that was, like, taken in for evidence. Okay. It was, like... Tested for accelerant and then put in the alley and disappeared. What? Yeah. I just don't think that the Austin Police Department was trained to handle a crime of this magnitude at the time. Yeah. They had only ever seen, like, one other arson murder before this. So, yeah. The bodies were transported for autopsy the next day, and they were not tested to see if any kind of accelerant was used directly on the bodies. Like, what? Yeah, they didn't test the bodies directly to see if there was any kind of accelerant. What the hell? They were able to conclude that Sarah had been sexually assaulted, but they also discovered two sets of male DNA on Jennifer. But after questioning her boyfriend, he confirmed that when she visited him a few hours before going into work, that they did have sex. So one set of male DNA was confirmed to be his, but the other set is still unidentified. Mm. It was also confirmed that Amy was sexually assaulted as well, and they were able to find one strand of male DNA on her, but no match was found. The cause of death was determined to be gunshot wounds, and then the files were sealed to protect the integrity of the case. They kept a lot of the specifics of the case close to the chest. They did not want to give the public a lot of information at first, like where the fire started, how much money was taken from the register, the caliber of the guns used, and the fact that Amy was shot twice with two different guns. And the arrangement of the girls' bodies, what the girls were bound with, and the fact that multiple pieces of the girls' clothing were missing. Mm -hmm. So they were trying to basically make it to where they were the only ones with this kind of information to weed out possible suspects. Right. Sarah, Amy, and Jennifer were all buried next to each other, and Eliza was buried closer to, like, where her parents lived. The funeral was filmed in case the murderers showed up. You know, they wanted to be able to, like, watch it back to see if anybody was acting suspicious, I guess. Over 1,500 people showed up to pay their respects to the girls, but despite everyone in Austin knowing someone who probably could have done this, Austin Police Department was no closer to finding who did it. So in January of 1992, Travis County brought in an FBI profiler, and this was the profile that the FBI gave. They thought more than one person was involved. One of them had a dominant personality, are more than likely white, late teens to mid-twenties. The one with the dominant personality possibly didn't finish high school and probably has an explosive, impulsive personality. 
either unemployed or working a very like menial job. Mm -hmm. Probably has a history of changing jobs often, possibly lives with a parent or guardian of some kind. They also thought that these people may have been frequent customers or at least knew the area very well to be able to like run from the scene without getting caught because I mean, yeah, nobody saw anybody fleeing from the scene. So they probably have like a criminal history or a history of abuse to women. Yeah, of course. That would make sense. They probably would have come back to the area later on that evening to watch the police and fire department sift through their handiwork or left town entirely and missed, you know, days of work or school after the murders. Mm -hmm. So the profile is kind of like all over the place, in my opinion. Like, it's, it really could be anybody. It could be anyone. Yeah. yeah. A lot of like maybes and probably and, you know, nothing like solidified, nothing set in stone. Yeah. So let's get into some of the leads and the suspects. A few months after the murders, investigators had over 400 tips and over 800 suspects. Wow. <laughs> yeah. They started interviewing as many people as they could. This included convicted serial killers, men with known anger issues and violent outbursts, and most notably, two people that in 1990 used small caliber pistols to rob a bowling alley, shoot the staff execution style, and set the building on fire. Well, but every lead and interview ended up the exact same with a dead end. Wow. Yeah. So at the same time, the Austin PD had their eyes peeled on another case. A few weeks after the Austin yogurt shop murders, a woman named Colleen Reed went missing from a local car wash. She was sexually assaulted and murdered. Her body wasn't found until 1998 when a, a man named Kenneth McDuff who was already on death row for the rape and murder of another woman, gave police the location of Colleen's body. He did this to get a more favorable sentence for his nephew, who was in prison for drug charges. Kenneth never officially confessed to killing Colleen, but gave them the location of her body, along with the locations of two other women that he had raped and killed. Well. <laughs> yeah. So, in the end, he would never actually confess to being the one behind the yogurt shop murders either, but some people to this day believe that Kenneth McDuff is the one behind the killings and that he took the secret to the grave with him when he was executed in 1998. Wow. So. Mm. In the following months, the Austin Police Department would also receive a lot of, like, prank calls regarding the murders and a lot of people calling, like, saying that they knew were dating or were related to the men who possibly did it. But most of these calls held like no weight to them whatsoever. Just kind of like this one girl got like really pissed at her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And so she called Austin PD and was like, I think my boyfriend did it. Oh my God. Like how, could, how does that even like, what kind of person <laughs> like girl, you need to be investigated. Not, yeah. your, not your man. Use a psycho bitch. <laughs> So I'm going to talk to you about one of the more promising leads. Okay. So a Hispanic man was seen sitting in his car of the yogurt shop the night of the murders. And a few months after the murders, Austin PD ended up putting out a composite sketch of this man. And a lot of people came forward with tips and a lot of them pointing toward this one guy named Armando Razzo. He was 19 years old at the time of the murders, and he was known to have, like, like pretty odd behavior that fell in line with the FBI profile. Okay. Uh, shortly after the murders, he quit his job at the Sonic Drive-In and told his friends that he was going into hiding. But before investigators could even question him, the media got a hold of the story and headlines were plastered with, quote, teen arrested in yogurt shop murders, end quote. Before he was even questioned. Holy shit. This would be one of the many incorrect and damaging headlines that would come regarding this case. Wow. Thanks, media. Yeah. Once Armando was interviewed, investigators realized that he had an airtight alibi and three witnesses to corroborate his story. Okay. So that's no for Armando. We jumped the gun a little bit, did we? Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, I guess, like, maybe the media got a little bit better with time, but to me, probably not really. But, I mean, in 1991, for them to go ahead and say, oh, this teen was arrested 
when he hasn't even been questioned. They don't give a shit about facts. They just no. want people to pay attention. <laughs> it, if it's sensationalizing anything, mm-hmm. that's what they're after. Yeah. They're the media. They don't care about the logistics. They just want people to read and listen. That's Yeah, it. exactly. So another person to seemingly match the sketch was Mexican nationalist Alberto Jimenez Cortez. Once his name came up, people said that if he was involved, then so were his two friends, Ricardo Hernandez and Perforio Villa Saavedra. I'm really hoping that I said that right. These men were actually already wanted for the kidnapping and rape of a woman at an Austin nightclub about a month before the murders. The likelihood that these men were involved seemed pretty promising considering the fact that the men were involved in like drug trafficking, violence and crimes against women, you know, just stand up men, like stand up guys. The best dudes. Not to mention the fact that they had also left town right after the murders. Mm. Great. In October of 1992, Cortez and Saavedra were arrested in suspicion to the yogurt shop murders, as well as the kidnapping and rape of the woman from the nightclub, drug trafficking, and gun smuggling. But unfortunately, considering these men were in Mexico City, they were able to be questioned, but not able to be extradited to the U.S. for prosecution. Wow. Which was a huge letdown in the case considering both men would confess to the yogurt shop murders. Mm. Yeah. But just as quickly as they confessed, their story started to fall apart. When Saavedra was questioned, he mentioned tying the girls up with rope and dismembering their bodies. Which, as we know, the girls were bound with clothing, not rope, and they were not dismembered. Why do people do that? Why do they confess to crimes that they didn't commit? I'll get there. I'll get there because this is some really, really handy police work at play in this case. It's got to be something like deeply psychological behind people who really just... I'll get there. Okay. (laughs) So after questioning these men, the investigators were certain that they did not kill the girls. And both men would eventually recant their confessions, stating that they were coerced violently into confessing stating that the officials put bags over their heads and threatened the men's families until they agreed to confess. Oh, my God. So not what I was thinking at all. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the police are the villains. Mm. It's not the first time in history that's oh, happened, absolutely. is it? No, absolutely not. <laughs> the men were convicted of the other charges regarding the kidnapping, drug trafficking, and gun smuggling, but they couldn't really be charged on... The yogurt shop murders. Yeah. Did they just want to close this case so bad, even if it's not real? Like yeah. If it's not the truth. Yeah. And I mean, that's awful. That's not real justice. No, it's families. not. It's not at all. But you find that there's so many, especially small town police departments, that are so hell bent on having a case be solved. That way they don't look bad. Yeah. Because if a case goes unsolved, then they look bad. You know what's worse? Making someone who didn't commit a crime confess to it and pay for it. (laughs) I actually just saw on Reddit like a few, like maybe an hour or so ago, a man, this is completely unrelated to the Austin Yogurt Shop murders, but a man was just released from prison after serving 40 years for a murder that he did not commit. 22 years ago in 2000, he tried getting them to retest the DNA, but they refused to do it until this year. Oh, my God. Yeah. 20 years. 22 years. How, that's how long they put off testing this DNA. And he'd already been in for 20. And he'd already been in for, yeah. And oh guess God. what? The saddest part, his mom died in June of this year, and he was released today. So a whole life that was yeah. missed and mm-hmm. ruined. His mom couldn't even see him be released. God, justice system needs major help. How sad is that? Like, I, whenever I saw that, I was like, I was shocked. I was shocked. Yeah, that's awful. Like, I mean, and we're eventually going to cover, like, the West Memphis Three. The West Memphis Three are, you know, three young men who served 18 years in prison for something that they didn't do. That's right. You know? Or, you know, like, it's... Spoiler alert, that's my thoughts on the West Memphis Three case. They served 18 years in prison for something that they did not do or something that there's no evidence that they did. Right. Yeah. So. God. Okay. So getting back on topic. (laughs) I'm sorry that I took a little detour, but I just felt very strongly about that. It's hard not to. 
So multiple people within the Austin Police Department ended up getting reassigned from the yogurt shop murders onto different cases. One of the people that would be reassigned would be Hector Polanco. Senior Sergeant Hector Polanco was known for his 100% clearance rate on every case he was involved with. So that means that basically every single person that he interviewed was charged. Shit. (laughs) 100%. 100%. Golly. He had a very big knack for getting confessions without evidence. Wow. He claimed that he just had a special ability to grab the truth from those that he interrogated. He had various nicknames such as The Boogeyman, El Diablo, and The Cobra. Sounds like a really nice teddy bear type of guy. Was that special ability uh, torture by chance? Yeah, well, well, we'll get there. Hmm. Back in the 80s and the 90s, nobody really believed in coerced confessions. They had a hard time believing that someone would confess to something that they didn't do. But in 1988, Hector obtained a confession from a young man named Christopher Ocha for the rape and murder of a young woman named Nancy Dupriest. Christopher immediately denied all involvement with the murder of Nancy, but after Hector threatened the death penalty if he didn't confess... He complied and also named his friend Richard Danzinger as his accomplice. Christopher knew that he was innocent, but he figured if he told Hector what he wanted to hear, that the evidence would prove him innocent later. Oh, no. But that didn't happen. And despite the lack of evidence, both men were sentenced to life in prison. Mm -hmm. This is very West Memphis 3 to me. Again, I'll say it again. I wrote it in my notes, but I'm saying it now again. (laughs) Um, Six years into their sentence, an inmate in a Texas prison would write letters to the police and media taking responsibility for the murder of Nancy. But it would take another six years before DNA evidence would prove this to be true. Christopher and Richard were released after serving 12 years in prison for a crime they did not commit. Wow. But at that point, Richard Danzinger had been brutally beaten in prison so bad that he had to have parts of his brain removed. (gasps) Oh. Yeah. Yeah. But all of this wasn't known at the time of the yogurt shop murders, and Hector was able to use these special little skills of his to garner multiple confessions from multiple suspects that were later cleared. Oh my god. But crooked police work wasn't a rarity in the Austin Police Department at this time. Hmm. Undercover informants would later say that the department was protecting the drug dealers of Austin in exchange for sexual favors, cocaine, and tickets to the Super Bowl. Oh my god. What an upstanding lot. Yeah. Wow. By 1997, there were more than 1,200 suspects, over 5,000 pages of handwritten notes, and over 10,000 pages of reports. Wow. Austin PD had a completely new team looking over the yogurt shop murders, and they decided to go back and look at the 1991 confession of 16-year-old Maurice Pierce. On December 14th, 1991, so about a week after the murders, Maurice was arrested at the North Cross Mall after reports came in that he was walking around with a 22 caliber pistol in one pocket and 16 bullets in the other. When Maurice was brought into custody, guess who wanted to perform his interview? Hector Hmm. Polanco. Mm -hmm. By the next morning, Hector had a confession for the yogurt shop murders. Not only did Maurice confess, but he also implicated some of his friends as well. Oh, God. Despite this confession being discredited in 1991 as well as 1996, the fresh eyes that were looking at the case in 1997 realized that this lead had not been properly looked into and properly cleared. When Maurice was interviewed again in 1997, he admitted that he did not stand by his confession and stated that, like many others, he felt forced by Polanco to confess. Mm-hmm. So Austin Police Department still had the gun that was confiscated from Maurice back in 1991, and they tested it and the bullets to see if it was used in the murders, and ballistics came back as a definitive no. Wow. But for some reason, investigators were still not convinced, and so they started looking into Maurice and the friends he was around in the days following the murder. This included Forrest Wellburn, who was 15 at the time, Michael Scott and Robert Springsteen, who were both 17 at the time of the murders. So you have a 15-year-old, a 16-year-old, and two 17-year-olds. God. On September 9th, 1999, Michael Scott, who was now 25 years old at this point, 
was brought in and interrogated for five days. Oh, wow. <laughs> After about 20 hours of questions, he confessed to the murders. He claimed that Maurice made him shoot one of the girls in the head. This confession was taped and recorded, and at one point you can actually see the detective holding a gun to Michael's head. Holy shit. Forcing the confession. How is this, like, yeah, how great. is this police work? Great question. Great question. Oh, my God. On September 15th, 24-year-old Robert Springsteen was picked up in Charleston, West Virginia, and interrogated for five hours. Parts of this interrogation was also recorded and filmed, and it showed Detective Ron Lara and a federal agent, Chuck Meyer, are seen yelling at Robert, getting all in his face, eventually getting him to confess to participating in the murders and for the sexual assault of Amy Ayers. I'm rolling my eyes. <laughs> you can't see this, but... He gave details of the case, but a lot of the details he gave were either mixed up or completely wrong. The police believe that the original plan was for the three boys to rob the yogurt shop while the fourth boy stayed in a getaway car, but that something went wrong and they ended up murdering the four girls instead. Which, okay, but a robbery gone wrong typically doesn't end up in, like, rape. No. Like... I'm sorry, no. There's intent that part, there. That part doesn't make sense. Like, you don't go into a yogurt shop intending to rob it and end up raping. Yeah. You a, don't go no. in for the cash register and say, oops, I raped oops. you. My bad. Maurice Pierce and Forrest Welburn adamantly denied that they had any involvement. Despite the gun not being the one used in the murders, and despite Maurice recanting his confession, and despite Hector Polanco's known interrogation tactics garnering the original confession, and the tactics used by the other detectives to get the confessions from Robert and Michael, on October 6th, 1999, all four young men would be arrested for the murders of Jennifer, Sarah, Amy, and Eliza. Blood and hair samples were taken from all four men, and by December of 1999, Maurice, Robert, and Michael were all indicted, but two grand juries failed to indict Forrest, and the charges against him were dropped in June of 2000, and he was released. Michael and Robert recanted their confessions, claiming that they were coerced into confessing. The trial for Robert Springsteen began in spring of 2001, and he was charged with Amy's murder, and the prosecution was seeking the death penalty. During the trial, portions of the interrogation was shown to the jury, and Dr. Richard Offshe, a social psychology professor, testified about the illegal tactics used by police that resulted in false confessions, but was unable to give his opinion of the tape that showed Michael being coerced. Like, they were pretty much like, you can tell us all you want about what you believe, but we're not letting you show your opinion on this tape. Wow. But outside of court, off she said that the tactics used on Michael are tactics that have absolutely gotten false confessions in the past. Not to mention the defense was only allowed to use two out of the 50 false confessions that were garnered in the case over the years. In the trial, they were allowed to submit Michael Scott's confession as evidence, but this may have violated Robert's rights to a cross-examination of all witnesses against him. Robert Springsteen was found guilty and sentenced to death. Wow. Michael Scott's trial was in 2002, and it was pretty much the same as Robert's, rinse and repeat. Robert's confession was used against Michael during his trial and w was found guilty on September 22, 2002, and sentenced to life in prison instead of death because he was 15 at the time of the crime. Wow. Daryl Croft, as well as another couple that was in the yogurt shop that evening, were not called in as witnesses in either trial. The evidence presented in both trials by the prosecution relied on the confessions and the confessions alone. So, no evidence. Great. Just confessions. Forced confessions. Maurice Pierce never even had a trial, and the charges against him were dropped in 2003 for lack of evidence, and he was released from prison after serving three years. However, the prosecution's tactic of using some of each one's alleged confessions at the other's trial was ruled to have violated the confrontation clause because the co-defendant was non-testifying. Both Michael and Robert's convictions were overturned on the confrontation clause alone, and the men were freed on June 24, 2009. Wow, 2009. Yeah. 
The prosecution insisted that they would be retried. However, forensic investigation showed that the DNA found was not theirs, nor was it Maurice's or Forrest's. The prosecution consequently abandoned plans for a retrial. Texas courts later decided that Michael, Robert, and Maurice were not entitled to compensation because they had not proven that they did not commit the crime. Hmm. Okay. On December 23rd, 2010, Austin police officer Frank Wilson and his rookie partner, Bradley Smith, conducted a traffic stop on a vehicle driven by Maurice Pierce in the northern part of the city. After a brief pursuit, Pierce struggled with Wilson before removing a knife from his belt and stabbing Wilson in the neck. Mm -hmm. Wilson, who survived his injuries, pulled out his gun and shot and killed Maurice Pierce. Oh, God. I wonder if, like, the reason why Maurice got into trouble later was due to the fact that he was, like, involved in all of this. Probably. I doubt it. On February 5th, 2022, it was announced that advanced DNA technology was bringing investigators closer than ever to solving the crime. Just this year. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. On August 3rd, 2022, President Joe Biden signed the Homicide Victims Families Rights Act into law, which was motivated by the yogurt shop murders. The law is intended to help ensure federal law enforcement reviews sometimes decades-old cold case files and applies the latest technologies and investigative standards, and if the case qualifies, new eyes will investigate using the latest technologies to try to solve them. That's good. Yeah. That's a good thing to implement. Yeah, so that was the Austin Yogurt Shop murders. Wow. A horrific crime that so many years later, over 30 years later, and it's still unsolved. And what an awful, like, testament to the police department there at the time, because, you know, like, the reason you try to solve a murder is to like bring peace to the families and, you know, like rest the souls of the dead and like... That wasn't obviously it obviously wasn't their intent at all, or at least I can't blanket the entire police department, but yeah. the ones the one that, you know, had the uh special way of getting confessions out of people. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like your intent is not to bring peace to the families or like the souls of the dead. Your intent is just to like have a make good yourself, reputation within the police department. Yeah. Realistically. Make your police department look good when in reality in the end you actually make yourself look worse. That's awful. And a lot of small town police departments have that problem. Jeez. So yeah, I guess that's where we'll end this rough hmm. pill to swallow of a case. That was rough. That's really sad. So that's really hard to hard for the families. Hard for you know the friends of the girls because they were so freaking young. It's, like, that's like like unthinkable. I mean, they were children. And all these years later when they would be adults and their case is still not solved. All right. So that is it for this episode of the Morning Hour podcast. Yeah. Let us know what you guys think. Um, send your thoughts, questions to what's the email address again? <laughs> the Morning Hour Pod at gmail dot com. All right. So and uh, you can also find us on Instagram at the Morning Hour Pod as well. M O U r-n-i-n-g that's right (laughs) and we will we hope you keep listening yeah and we will see you in the next one or like you'll hear us (laughs) (laughs) either way we'll be there yep (laughs) all right bye Bye.